resources. So really uh, it is to encourage everyone to listen, participate, engage, and ask as many questions as possible. So thank you so much once again, colleagues. Thank you, thanks for the intro. I'm going to hit share quickly so you can see my slides. Um, so as I said before, I'm from the Department of Economic Development and Tourism, and our role has really been to engage the business and the private sector around vaccine rollout um, in the province. We've done this in a, in a couple of ways, and I'm trying to get my slides to go, and they're not doing it. There we go. Let's see. Ah, there we go. We've done this in a couple of ways. Um, so we've been having a lot of private sector engagements where we share information like the one today. We've also been providing support to businesses and private sector bodies, academia, research institutions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to actually establish vaccination sites. And you may find that you have one at your campus. Um, and then also just drive more broadly vaccination uptake in the province. We've been doing this in partnership with our sister departments in the Department of Health, the Premier, and then also industry bodies like Business for South Africa, West Grow, and our private sector stakeholders. To date, we've had a lot of engagements. We've had about 50 companies where whom we've engaged directly with Minister and about 90 um, who've had we've had meetings with and one-on-ones. We had about 20 different sessions um, to provide bespoke support to actual follow-up sessions to corporates. And this has largely been around setting up these mass vaccination sites and open and workplace vaccination sites. If you've been following the media, you'll also see we've got week, uh, weekly premier updates um, and a lot of other info has been circulated. We've also managed to forge nice relationships with the retailers and the bankers. Um, and so when it comes to vaccine uptake and registration drives, they've onboarded and in particular their help on the SASA days when we were trying to get the over 60s to register, which in itself was a challenge. Um, finding obviously you guys um, being in the youth segment, being a lot more savvy and a lot more switched on and registrations just absolutely skyrocketed when, when the over 18 category opened up for registration. We've also managed to mobile, uh, mobilize and have some retail sites um, and just have like retail sector engagement through the Consumer Goods Council and the Council of Shopping Centres. This stuff's pretty boring, so I'm just going to shoot straight through it. So this was just a snapshot of the vaccination site at the Convention Centre in Cape Town. Um, and this is like a super max site. I mean, I think it can process and doc can, can actually confirm something like 4,000 vaccines a day at its peak. So this is a mass vaccination site. But just so that you know, there are about 173 sites in the private sector set up in the province at the moment. And that's really to assist the Department of Health in augmenting their offering and increasing vaccinations, of which 27% are actually done through private sites at the moment. And these are sites like this one that you see there, or ones at big business headquarters, or also like Clicks and Discam and MediRite and all those kinds of pharmacies. That's what we've been up to, and in particular to increase vaccine uptake, we are we've developed a lot of communication material, which you've probably seen on social media, and we're starting to host sessions like this around myth busting because people we've seen an increase in registrations and then a panning out. Um, and we really need to try and address that to encourage people to get vaccinated. And you often find it's people that are unsure or waiting for more information, or typically on an adoption curve, you've got your early adopters and then your laggards. And I think we, we're starting to dip off into that category now, but Doc can shed more light on that for you. We're also going to set up a vaccine ambassadors program. So it'll be very interesting after this session if you can give feedback or even in the chat, if you would like to become a vaccine ambassador, either at your campus or in your community. Um, and we are running a session on the 4th of October to actually train you up with information in order to be able to share that more broadly and with confidence that the information you have is actually, you know, evidence based and correct. So with that, Further ado, and I hate saying that, I just wanted to show you my contact details, which I'll share afterwards again, and then hand over to Dr. Melvin Mudley, who is your guy for the rest of the day, um, who will be answering 
all your questions, providing some information, and um, really it's from the doctor's mouth, literally. So please take this opportunity either verbally or in the chat to pose your questions to Dr. Mugli. Over to you. So hi everyone, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you today. Um, very briefly, my name is Melvin Mudley. I'm a medical doctor working in the Western Cape Department of Health. Uh, in terms of my experience, I have been in hospital management, having managed two large hospitals. Uh, I'm now currently the director of health intelligence, which um, is the unit that analyzes COVID-19 infections and COVID-19 vaccinations. And I also run the electronic vaccine data system for the Western Cape. I'm also a teacher at the University of Cape Town on various courses. But that aside, the reason I'm here today is linked to what was said initially, that people are, are, are looking for credible sources of information. And a lot of times there's so much information that no one really knows what to listen to and where to turn. Now, for myself, I use what I call the m, &M system, right? Not the singer, but the m, &M system, system stands for the following. The first M is my method, and my method is always based on science. So when you listen to me, I'll always say things like, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine, this is from the CDC, I'll tell you when I got the information, where I got the information from. Because often when you speak to people, especially when they're saying things, they say things that they've heard from someone else. I will take you to the source of the information. So that's the first M. This other M is the motive. Now you must always ask yourself when someone says something to you, what is their motive? Why are they saying it to you? My motive is very clear. I want to make sure that you are safe, that your family is safe, and that we can go back to a normal way of living. So that's my motive. Other people may have different motives. They may want some attention. They may want to get you scared. They may want to just pass on information that they've heard somewhere else. For me, it is about helping you. And that's what I'm going to base this entire session on. Now, people have lots of questions about COVID-19 vaccines. And I'm my favorite, I'll, I'll take the questions in the chat, make no mistake, I will. But I would love to hear from you. I'd love you to ask your questions directly and then we can have an engagement in a chat. Doctors love chatting to their patients and, and I enjoy talking to my patients as much as any doctor. So please go ahead and any question is, is, is permitted. There are no silly questions. There are no questions of limits. If there's anything on your mind, go ahead and ask. So whoever's ready. I see we've got a hand already. Yeah. Jamaica, um, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity and this information sharing session. Um, as you uh, we're all aware, there's 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 a lot of lot of myths that are going on around, and um, I think the reason why all of us are here, including myself, is to get make sure that we, we, we get the information right from the experts. So thank you so much for hosting these sessions. We really, really appreciate it. But my question is more on the recent developments um, in as far as the vaccination is concerned. I'm a pregnant lady. And so, yeah, um, and I think in, in, in the past, my doctor had, had um, not really encouraged me to take the vaccine, but now there's been recent communication to say that it's actually quite beneficial even for the unborn babies that um, um, uh, pregnant women are encouraged to, to take the vaccine because there hasn't been any evidence um, that it affects the baby or the mother negatively. Can you comment on that, Doc, or um, give us some more information on it? Thank you so much. Absolutely. And here's a question that affects you on a personal level. And I'm going to tell you about how it affected me on a personal level as well, because my one of my family members asked me whether they could take the vaccine even though they were breastfeeding. So we'll start at the beginning. In the beginning, we did not have enough evidence about the safety in pregnant and breastfeeding women. Uh, and that's because when we do research, we have to be extra careful with pregnant women and breastfeeding women. We can't, we, we have to be more cautious with that group. Now, over time though, and we've given so many vaccines, we now have very strong evidence. So in a recent publication by the American College of 
obstetricians and gynecologists in the United States and in a statement by the CDC. They have come out in full support of all pregnant women and all breastfeeding women to be, to be vaccinated. vaccinated. Right? And if you go if to you the go, or in any way in South Africa, at any point in your pregnancy, there's no limitation in terms of when you are pregnant, the first trimester, second trimester, or third trimester, you will be vaccinated, right? Now, a little bit more data on this. Sorry, can I ask someone to turn off their sound? I'm going to mute you. OK, thank you very much. Back on. OK, great, thanks. So in terms of the evidence, They've researched it thoroughly now. The COVID-19 vaccine does not cause miscarriages. It does not cause a woman to lose her baby, right? Um, so it is safe to give during pregnancy and it is safe to give during breastfeeding. Further, it does not harm the baby at all. So that's the COVID-19 vaccine. But more than that, the gynecologists were very worried because COVID-19 infection has now been shown to be more serious in pregnant women than in the general population. So pregnant women are more at risk from COVID-19 than someone in the general population or someone the same age who's not pregnant. And pregnant women can have more severe effects from COVID-19 or they can have a miscarriage from COVID-19. So there's the risks of COVID-19 and there are no risks from the COVID-19 vaccine so the um, the obstetricians and gynecologists in the US and in South Africa have been very clear and across the world, uh, including the World Health Organization, pregnant women can and in fact should be vaccinated, but right? it is good for them and it is good for the baby and it protects. So the simple answer is please get vaccinated if you're pregnant, please get vaccinated if you're breastfeeding and both the vaccines that are offered in South Africa, Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer are safe during pregnancy. Now I'll jump on that and I'll add another question, which is, and I'm just looking at the, um, um, I'm, 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 I'm going to look at, uh, I'm just looking at the chat, but the question of infertility comes up. And now this is not necessarily pregnant people, but it's related. So someone will say, if I'm a man, if I have a vaccine, does it mean I won't be able to have children? If I'm a woman and I have a vaccine, does it mean I won't be able to have children? And that's a legitimate concern. So when people came up with that concern, we researched it. And COVID-19 vaccines do not cause a problem with fertility. So it won't make you infertile. You will still be able to have children. I'm not saying you need to go out and have children right now, but you will still be able to have children. It does not cause infertility. And, and in fact, a lot of people say, but it's not true. It, it, it's very clear from our scientists that it doesn't cause infertility. And again, the American College of Gynecologists came out and the CDC supported that statement as well. So you do not have to worry about that particular issue with regards to COVID-19. Right, Thank so that answers, that, that answers It's a pleasure. It's, does it answer your question fully? It does. Thank you so much. Yes. Excellent. And to let you know, I told my breastfeeding relative, please go and get yourself vaccinated, right? No one in my family is pregnant at the moment. I don't think unless I'm going to get a phone call from someone soon. But if they are, I'm going to go tell them to get vaccinated as well. Great. Are there any other questions from the group? And while I'm waiting. Yeah. OK, let's check. Now, guys. Please, I'm, I'm happy with the chat, but I love talking to people. So please don't be shy. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping someone can ask me a question I can't answer because I have a rule. My rule is I don't guess. If I can't answer, I'll come back to you, right? I'll go and research it and come back to you. But I'm, and I'm hoping I'll get one of those questions today. But I see we've got two questions in the chat, I'll, uh, in, in uh, two hands up. Let's do those hands and then I'll move a little bit to the chat to give people a little bit of time. So some, Lisa, do you know who put their hand up first? Uh, I can see and Althea, but there was someone before Althea. Sibusiso. Sibusiso, would you please ask your question and then we'll go to Althea. Thank, thanks, Doc. Um, thank, thank you very much, Lisa, and you, Doc, for, for the session today. I just want to check, Doc, uh, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to ask you. One is, uh, uh, first of all, is how, how, how effective 
Or what is the efficacy of the first jab, right? How how much protection does it, it give you if you only have like one jab, right? And then the second question that I have is um, for the Johnson & Johnson, right? And most of the health uh, practitioners had their first uh, kind of, uh, and for the Johnson, they, they had their uh, jab uh, at the beginning of the year, right? When uh, we initiated the vaccine rollout in the country. And I know for the J and J is only one J. Given that now we are almost in September, and I believe it has been in some instances more than six months since they have vaccinated. How how, how long uh, does the the J and J protect you? And then is, do we have to start considering now the the second J example for our healthcare workers? given that they use the J&J. &J. And then for the Pfizer vaccine, after we get the, the second dose, and then we get that uh, full kind of uh, protection, how, how long again do we have to wait until we talk about the booster? Because I see a lot of countries now, they're already talking about the booster shots, but I know in our country, we haven't even started to vaccinate enough people to be thinking about vaccination. But I think for the healthcare, specifically given that they use the J&J, &J, they need to be considering the, uh, the sorry, the booster shot. Any comments on that, Doc? Uh, those are very interesting questions. You've sort of answered some of the question in your statement, but let's let's go through it step by step, right? Now you asked me about one jab. Generally, we don't pay too much attention to one jab in the two jab dose because we know that one jab does not afford you full protection. And I've pulled it up and I'm looking at it, and this is by Bernal et al and they looked at vaccine effectiveness against um, the, um, f uh, from one shot of Pfizer, it's 36%, I'm just checking uh, verse infection. So vaccine effectiveness, vaccination effectiveness, Pfizer one dose is 36% against Delta and AstraZeneca vaccine one dose is 30% effective against Delta. Now, you asked me a specific question, so I gave you a specific answer. But let me put it to you this way. What we've seen is most of the vaccines did really well against alpha, but we know that there have been beta, alpha, beta, gamma, and then delta. And so delta, the, the vaccines which were built initially, sorry, they were not built for alpha, they were built, built for the original COVID-19, or what we call wild type COVID-19. So we notice that they are le slightly less effective against Delta. So there's a drop in effectiveness, there's a drop in efficacy and effectiveness against Delta. With a single dose of Pfizer, as I said, 36% against Delta. But with two doses of, De uh, of, of, of Pfizer, it's 88% effective against symptomatic disease for, for COVID-19, and that's symptomatic disease. It's over 95 effective for severe illness and death. And similarly, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is 91 to 96% effective against, severe, uh, against death uh, in co from COVID-19. So as you can see, you asked me about one dose, so I'll answer. One dose is not as effective as two doses. So if you're taking a two dose vaccine, please take two, your two doses. And in fact, we only consider you fully protected 14 days after your second dose, right? Um, but if you take your, your Johnson & Johnson, which is a one-dose vaccine, the only one-dose vaccine at the moment, or you take your two doses of Pfizer, it has excellent protection against severe illness and death, over 90%. In fact, Pfizer over 95% and uh, Johnson & Johnson 91 to 96 protection against death. That's the first part of your question. The second part is a very tricky one because you're talking about how long is your vaccine effective? And in fact, the other thing about you, you're asking is, do you get, does the, the functionality or the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine wane over time? It's a question the whole world is asking. So we know that the United States started offering boosters in September. We know that the UK is gonna start offering boosters in the 50 to 60 age group. We know that Israel has already been offering boosters from July. Now, Sibusisu, it's a very controversial thing. They looked at data and they said, 
we are concerned. It wasn't published data, it was data. The data itself, people have different opinions on it, but they felt that they didn't want to take a chance and they wanted to protect their citizens. So they decided we're going to go for it and we are going to offer booster doses. There's still a lot we're learning about this, right? But clearly they feel the vaccine is safe enough to give their people a third dose. And in fact, they believe in it so much that they're giving themselves a third dose. The World Health Organization has come out and said, listen, I understand you want to give your people third doses, and that's great, but there's so much of the world that hasn't received one dose. There are health workers in Africa who haven't received one dose. So the World Health Organization have been very clear, we need to vaccinate the people at risk first and get them at one dose and two doses before we run around looking at booster doses. So in South Africa, we are very clear. We will look at the, the data around, um, around uh, boosters, but for now, our focus is making sure that we vaccinate as many people as possible. For uh, We want to make sure that everyone is fully vaccinated, super CISO, so we want two doses of Pfizer or one dose of Johnson & Johnson. Now, you asked the question about Johnson & Johnson, and, because, and I'm watching the time. I'm a health worker. I got Johnson & Johnson. You ask if should the health workers who received Johnson & Johnson received a booster? There isn't any evidence that that is necessary right now. And there's a lot of aspects of immunity we don't fully understand, but it is being looked at and people are trying to research it to come with a definitive answer. So right now, Sibusisu, there isn't a definitive answer. If there is a definitive answer that, that health workers need a booster because of Johnson and & Johnson and, and after a certain amount of time, immunity weighs off, then we will look at it. There is a reality that we may need boosters. We may need boosters, and that's something we can look at in the months to come. Uh, and, and that's where we are right now. I say I got a thumbs up from you, so I'm quite happy with that. And I'm going to take, uh, I think it was, who was the next person on um, uh, who wanted to uh, ask a question, Lisa? Althea. Good afternoon, Doc, and yeah. thanks for the session. It's something that we all need, especially if we want to address um, hesitancy because from where I stand, I'm a professional nurse at Campus Health and hesitancy according to the students is because of lack of knowledge. Yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of things I'm going to list and this is what we get from our students. The first one you covered, which was infertility and something which I heard for the first time that I heard about female infertility, but it was also said that male infertility is affected. You covered that one. What they want to know is what is the long term effects? Should I get vaccinated? The second one is alcohol use. Can I use alcohol if I get vaccinated? Pre-vaccination and post-vaccination and how long should I wait? The other one, they're very concerned about the side effects. Um, and the last one I want to ask you, we had a student which we vaccinated and she vomited immediately post-vac. What is our plan for when she comes for a second Pfizer? Excellent. I love these questions. OK, so let's dive into it, right? Um, long term effects. So this is a vaccine, right? So let's let's talk a little bit about how the vaccine works. So the vaccine, you get injected with it. It goes into your body. It teaches your body to build antibodies. I'll, I can give you more detail when we get to that question. And then the vaccine is very quickly broken down. So it actually disappears from your body, right? The Pfizer vaccine gets broken down very quickly, but the Johnson & Johnson also gets broken down very quickly. So the vaccine isn't in your body for very long. Historically, there, it is exceedingly rare to get side effects from vaccines after six weeks, right? Because it's in your system for, so, for such a short amount of time. Now they've done studies. We've been giving Pfizer since January, uh, since December 2020 in the US and other countries. We've been given Johnson and Johnson since uh, February 2021. So we've been watching this vaccine and we've been studying and we've been researching it. There are no, there is no evidence of uh, long term effects from the vaccine. So this the, we are aware of the side effects and I'll talk about side effects right now and those are the 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 early side effects but there's no effects that appear 
after six weeks or after eight weeks or after 10 weeks. Now, what we say about this is the following. The chances of any long term effects, because you can never say you are 100 percent about anything, but they are this big. The chances of long term side effects from COVID-19 are this big. And you've heard of long COVID, people having brain fog, people having long term loss of smell, loss of taste, people having long term lung damage from COVID-19. That's very well documented and we're getting more and more cases of people with long COVID. We're not documenting cases of long term effects from COVID-19. So in general, the way vaccines work, it's rare. It, 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 it is rare that we can have long term effects after six weeks. But we've done extensive research on COVID-19. We're not picking long term effects up uh, from COVID-19. The issue of alcohol use, as with anything, you know, you've got to be. Moderate with everything that you do. There is no direct effect of alcohol on the vaccine or of the vaccine on alcohol. But in general, we don't recommend that on the day of your vaccine, you go and have 10 or 20 beers, right? If you have, so, so, so there isn't a contraindication to that. So don't do anything excessive on the day you take, you, you have your vaccine. If you ask me, someone asked me if, if my brother came to me for advice, I'll say, look, on the day of your vaccine, don't go out drinking. Just go and have your vaccine and relax after that. And then the next day, by all means, go in. Uh, if you want to have something to, to some alcohol, then you, you're welcome to do so. But there's no direct relationship between alcohol and drinking. The vaccine doesn't affect the alcohol and the alcohol doesn't affect the vaccine. But as with anything in life, be sensible about what you do. And I hope that answers the question. In terms of the side effects, the side effects of the vaccine the vast majority, right? The vast majority are what we call minor side effects. I'm, I'm going to read something to you. So Adrian Gore from Discovery, they looked at the data from Discovery and they said that less than one in 20 had any side effects and that's the minor side effects and even less had anything more serious. If we look at the Johnson and Johnson studies, we look at a tiny percentage that actually had less than five per hundred, uh, no, around five per hundred thousand had a serious side effect and a small percentage had side effects at all. And if you look at Pfizer, again, five per hundred, one to five per hundred thousand had a serious side effect. So what are the side effects? Because I'm going to give you all the information. The vast majority of you will get, a, if, you, if you're going to get a side effect at all, let me just start by saying most people don't get side effects. But for those people that do get side effects, you might find about two hours after you get your vaccine, your arm is a little bit sore, right? I noticed that my arm was a little bit sore. My wife noticed that her arm was a little bit sore. Some people get a headache, a bit of sweating, a bit of body aches, a day, really two days after the vaccine, right? Um, my friend said that he, um, he felt very tired uh, about 12 hours after the vaccine and that continued for about 12 hours, but nothing that lasts more than a day, maximum two days. Uh, in general, most of my family had very minor side effects. There are serious side effects, both from the Johnson & Johnson and the Pfizer. They are incredibly rare and even for those we have treatment, but it's interesting. It's interesting that for those people that had side effects, if you think about the serious, the serious side effects from COVID-19, they did a study in Israel and they said that they looked at the serious side effects from the vaccine, which were very rare, one to five in a hundred thousand, and they compared it to the risks from the COVID-19 itself. So they looked at the risk from the vaccine and the risk of COVID-19 and the risks from COVID-19 were far higher than the risks from the vaccine itself. That there were a few cases of, of serious side effects from the vaccine and a lot of cases of people having severe illness and even dying from COVID-19 infection. So that's what we're trying to do. We try to balance the risk between the two, but from a straight answer, it's an extremely safe thing to take. It's one of the safest medications. It's not 100%. Some people do have minor side effects. Very, very few have more serious side effects, which we can treat. You asked me about someone who vomited immediately after having the vaccine. I'm reluctant to give you 
exact advice because every individual is different. So I would need to consult and examine the individual. But there's a lot of reasons why people can vomit. It can be a stress response. It can be that they had a side effect. It's not an indication that they shouldn't take the vaccine again. As a general rule, anyone who experienced something not great, as a doctor, I would say, uh, and this is not written in any manual, but I would be a little bit more cautious and I would observe them for 30 minutes after the vaccine rather than 15 minutes after the vaccine. But I think for that individual, it's more about assessing their specific circumstances and tailoring a solution for them. But a simple episode of vomiting, if that's all it was, is not a contraindication to having your second dose. In fact, they should get their second dose so that they can be protected against COVID-19. Right, does that answer you? Are you good? Thanks, Doc. Yes, thanks okay. very much. Uh, Lisa, who's, the, who's Ramina. next? Ramina, Dr. Ramina. Hi, um, good afternoon, colleagues and students and Dr. Moodley. Thank you so much for this very informative session. And, um, you know, the questions are just, um, it, it's definitely food for thought. Um, I am thankfully fully vaccinated and I've experienced minor side effects, so I'm very, very grateful for that. But I do have a question. Um, I know someone who received his first jab and uh, about Four weeks after his first jab, he then contacted COVID-19. So um, he's out of isolation and his symptoms were then rather minor, thankfully as well, after his first, yes, after his first vaccination. However, I have a bit of a concern because his doctor is now saying to him that he does not need to take the second um, vaccination at all. Um, what is your um, advice on that? Thank you, Dr. Moodley. OK, so, you know, doctors don't like to contradict other doctors. I'm going to tell you what I did in my personal circumstances. So. When I talk to you, I'm not just talking to you as a doctor, I'm talking to you as a person who's who's living in the same situation you are. My brother was in exactly the same situation. He had his first dose. And then before he could have his second dose, he became infected with COVID-19. In fact, I told him to go get the test. So he now had infection and he said to me, well, Melvin, what do I do now? And I said, well, you wait 30 days and you go for your second dose, right? And that's the advice I have given my brother. Now, your story is so fascinating because there's so many aspects to it. The first part of your story is that the person had their first dose and they got infected. Now, the first part of that story is that one dose of Pfizer is not enough to fully protect you. You need two doses, 42 days apart in South Africa, 21 days in the US, right? Different countries have slightly different ranges. And you are, your body builds immunity two weeks after the second dose. So you are regarded as fully vaccinated and protected two weeks after your second dose of Pfizer and 28 days after your, your single dose of Johnson and Johnson. Now, so, so you may get infected in that period. Sometimes you may get infected if you've taken the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and after, and after 30 days you get infected, or you've taken the Pfizer and after 14 days after your second dose you get infected. We call that a breakthrough infection. And we've noticed that we are getting breakthrough infections. Now you might say, well, why? There's two reasons. One, the vaccine isn't perfect, right? Two doses of vaccine of Pfizer will protect you about 88% against what we call symptomatic infection. Uh, Johnson & Johnson a little bit less. So it's not perfect. Also, the vaccines were developed during the original COVID-19 virus. So the other new types of viruses have learned to escape the vaccine. There's a little bit of escape. And so Delta escapes a little bit more than the original virus. So if you are fully vaccinated, you can still get infected. But then you said something interesting. Their symptoms were not that severe. And what we have found is that if you've been vaccinated and you get COVID-19, by and large, your symptoms are much milder. So let's say you've got a 70 year old grandmother and she's been vaccinated or a grandfather, he's been vaccinated and he's been fully vaccinated, the time has passed, and he gets COVID-19. 
the vaccine protects you. You will get it, yours, you, your infection will be less severe than the person who's not vaccinated at all. And that's the big thing that we want to say to people. I'll add one more thing to what you, you asked. How long after infection do you get vaccinated? There's no hard and fast rule about that. The answer is, um, uh, but, but what we say is, we want to give the immune system some time to recover, and we say 30 days. So 30 days from the date of, inf uh, from the date of symptoms, or if you're asymptomatic, 30 days from the date of your test. So if you've been infected, whether it's between your first and second dose, or, uh, or before your first dose, you wait 30 days before you get vaccinated. Does that answer you? Yes, okay. thank you. Thank like you so much. Stuff. So you heard what <laughs> thank I told, you. you. You heard what I told my own brother, OK? My own family. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next question, please. Good afternoon, talk. I'm not talking. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Thanks, thanks, Miss. I want to ask why the vaccination program is done according to age groups, or rather, than everyone who's willing to take a jab must take a jab. And the second question: Why, after you take the first jab, you should wait about forty, or I'm not sure, forty or thirty days uh, before you take another the, the second jab? Thank you. Excellent question. So you're actually getting into the history of this now. So I remember sitting with with the Department of Health and we were talking about it, right? In the beginning, we did. The reason why we said we must target certain age groups is because of availability of vaccines. We didn't have that many vaccines, so we needed to use the vaccines against the people that were most at risk. So initially, the people that were most at risk where the medical uh, people working in hospitals, because that's where sick people come who have COVID-19. So the people who are most exposed were the people working in hospitals. When we opened it up to the general public, the people most at risk, we looked at everything. We looked at diabetes, HIV, and all of that. And we found that the single most reliable indicator of a person's being at risk is their age. And so we started it in 60 plus, then we went to 50 plus, then for the 35 to 49, and then 18 and above. At the same time, we also did other risk groups like teachers, but it's all about risk. And you'll see that in most countries, whenever they're starting something, they will start with the older age bands. When I say at risk, if you look at it, right, if you are 18, 19, 20, your chances of dying from COVID-19 are actually quite low. It's still possible, but it's low. If you are 70, 80 and 90, your chances of dying from COVID-19 are much higher. So it's about risk and making sure that we don't, we, 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 we take care of the people that most need it. That's the answer, I've got a thumbs up from you. So you ask a nice question about one to 21 days and one to 42 days. In the United States, they give the vaccine, uh, the spread is 21 days, the two Pfizer shots. In South Africa, it's 42 days I think in the UK, it's a little bit longer. Now, why do they have that spread? The spread is based on the research done in the lab and evidence that showed how our Im uh, immune response developed. So when they did the initial testing for Pfizer, they found that the 21 days was the right amount of gap. Now, why do you need a gap at all? You need a gap because you get the vaccine, you develop what we call immunoglobulins. So your body develops the, the memory to fight the, the virus. And then your, your immune system needs to relax a bit. And then you get a boost, it picks up again. So you have a double memory. The, um, the, um, the, the, the stretching it out to 42 days was as a result of research that showed that the, um, the, the boost increased your immunoglobulins a little bit more. Um, and so certain countries have chosen that path versus uh, the 21 days. Uh, that, that's pretty much the, the, the reason why there's a spread. But there has to be a spread because it needs to give your body time to adjust and rebuild the immunoglobulins. OK, can we then go yes. to the next question? Got so it. the yes. next question so. is from Dr. Jan Hechu, and I caution you. Because what I remember is Doc was a, 
it a doctor in stats? Which is <laughs> <laughs> so yes, so, uh, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, um, uh, 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 Dr. Moodley, for a, 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 an informative session thus far. Um, I've got a couple of weird questions, maybe. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, when we talk about the vaccines itself, um, uh, you've mentioned a bit earlier that uh, after about six weeks, you actually don't experience serious side effects um, or of, yeah, after a period of six weeks. Um, one of the uh, concerns I have is, is that based on normal vaccines or is that, that based on these mRNA or viral vector vaccines? Because my understanding of it is that these mRNA vaccines or viral vector vaccines are new technology. So it, it's not um, vaccines that has been used widely in the past. Um, so that's that's a that's a bit of a concern um, that I do have, and that ties in with my next question, um, which a part of it you have already answered about long-term side effects. Um, but a problem that I that I have, or a serious concern that I have, is chances of autoimmune disease in future because I've read about the possibility of that. Um, and one of the things that I have um, also read about, um, and it, it also uh, is a bit of a concern, there's uh, quite a lot of overseas doctors, um, including uh, Nobel Prize laureates that are warning against antibody dependent enhancement. And not that I'm 100% sure what it is, um, but they are warning against it. And should we take this as fake news or is it true? Or because there's all sorts of things. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a statistician. So um, I like to look at things um, or look at the, the data. Um, and yeah, and now I'm not sure what to look at. You, 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 you understand what I mean? Sure. Um, secondly, with regards to, uh, or, well, not secondly, another question I have is also with regards to the Delta variant, because we've seen that um, vaccinated people can still get the Delta variant. They uh, they, they get sick with it. Maybe the they symptoms are not as severe, but um, in Israel specifically, um, they say that approximately 78% of the population is vaccinated. And initially we said we would get herd immunity at 67%. Uh, so now we're already in Israel above that. They're already busy with their booster shots. Um, and when I looked at, at what was happening in Israel, um, I think it was last week, Monday, um, they had more infections than more new cases than in South Africa. Um, at or on the same day uh, for the Delta variant. So they had 10,000 um, uh, new cases, approximately 10,000 new cases, um, and their population size is only 8 million. And they had more, um, uh, inf yeah, more new cases than in South Africa at the same, same time. And we're also relatively on the peak still slightly going down of the Delta variant infections in South Africa. So that is a, yeah, that is that is a bit of a concern. If I look at, at the percentage, percentage wise at the infections and um, something maybe you, you would know the answer, maybe not. Um, the fact that they give booster shots um, tells me that um, maybe the 10,000 people needed hospitalization. So what it did was it, it placed strain on their health system. Um, so I'm not sure the, uh, you know, I, I don't want to make a statement because I, 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 I don't know. Um, but these are questions that I start asking when I look at the data. Why would it be a problem um, if people don't get serious disease? Because if people get a cold, for example, um, yeah, if, if, if people get a cold, for example, um, it's not a serious disease. So you wouldn't need a vaccine for a cold. Y you understand? You wouldn't need a booster shot for a, for, for a common cold symptom or symptoms. Um, so these are just some of my, my concerns. So 
if you can answer them, I will appreciate it. If you cannot, then um, <laughs> you know it's 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 not an issue. But these are just concerns that I that I that sure. I have. So um, thanks so much. Yeah. So let's let's try and go with this. So this this issue of antibody enhancements and whoever these Nobel laureates are, you will have to send me that, and I'll try and search that for myself. But a concern is not, you know, peer reviewed literature. And so I'd have to look into this and see what they're saying and try to understand what their concern is. But to answer your question specifically, this issue of six weeks, you are quite correct, is it's all the vaccines that we have given up to this point. And while the mRNA vaccines are, have just been deployed recently, the way that they work still allow us to draw assumptions about how they will behave in the body. So for example, all the vaccines, their main purpose is to create an immunological response to teach your body to form antibodies. Your body clears the mRNA vaccine very quickly. It clears the Johnson & Johnson vaccine very quickly. And then you have your antibodies and you have your, main, uh, you, the, uh, your antibodies. Initially, there's a surge in your antibodies, then they go down and then you have memory cells so that your body can recognize a new infection that comes in. And that's how almost all the vaccines work. And that's certainly how the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the mRNA vaccines work. So historically, we don't get issues after six weeks or we don't get long term side effects from vaccines after six weeks. Now, because this is COVID-19, we have researched this vaccine for over a year in uh, for, for the Johnson & Johnson and the Pfizer vaccines. And we have been watching it in the field, Pfizer since December 2020 and Johnson & Johnson since February 2021. And we have done extensive research. Now, as a statistician, you will appreciate that we've given almost 6 billion vaccines, right? And there are no warning signals about long-term side effects yet, right? And so the, the, the view of the experts in the New England Journal of Medication and certainly the CDC, right, and they've stated their views, is that right, the chances of long-term side effects are very low and we haven't picked up anything despite extensively looking for it and ex intensively watching for it. Now, a group of Nobel laureates that are talking about antibody enhancement, I'll have to check up and I will get back to you on that particular one. The issue of herd immunity, and that's a great question. The issue of herd immunity is, is simply this. We thought that initially, if enough people get infected, that we will get herd immune or vaccinated, we will get herd immunity. That was before beta, gamma, delta, and, and there's four, five new variants of interest, and we've got C1 and 2. And the new variants have immune escape. So with the immune escape, we find that people who have had COVID-19 are sometimes getting COVID-19 again. People who have vaccines are sometimes still getting infected. Of course, the people who have get, had vaccines have a far better outcome. And I'll say this again, a far better outcome than the people who haven't had vaccines, right? And so what we find then is that we that 70% is not allowing us to reach herd immunity, even in South Africa where discovery thinks that up to 80%, 70 to 80% of the people have been infected. So we're not getting herd immunity because the, the variants have uh, an ability to escape. But if we think about what has been happening in this country, we've got to ask ourselves, we are worried about our own health. Do we have anything that will protect me against severe symptoms or severe illness, right? Severe illness from COVID-19. And the answer is we do. We have the vaccines, right? That have excellent, as a statistician, you understand this, of 91 to 96% effectiveness against preventing death in, in, um, uh, in the Johnson & Johnson and over 95% with the Pfizer. So we've got excellent treatment. The last question you ask is about Israel. So the data on Israel has not been um, published in a peer reviewed article. But they looked at data and they made a call to protect their population to give a booster vaccine. And they made that call based on data looking at decreased uh, on, on various aspects, right? 
but it was looking, they, they were concerned about decreasing immunity over time, which I think Sibusiso asked about uh, really early. Now, the issue about the cases, and I don't want to get too technical here, but you can't compare the number of positive cases in Israel versus South Africa, irrespective of the populations, because it depends on the testing being done in both countries. So you might get a lot of people tested, but you may that might be an indication that they're testing more people. Uh, you also can't draw the inference that people who are tested positive are in hospital. Um, so, that, so look, we can look into it, right? But I think what we've got to understand is Israel has made a call to go for their boosters. They believe the vaccines are safe and they believe a booster offers uh, their population an even better chance at protection against severe hospitalization and death. The last thing I'm going to say is in this country alone, we've lost 250,000 people through through COVID-19, right? Uh, and and, and in, the, in the world, I'll just check quickly, it's probably more, but uh, the latest uh, from the World Health Organization was 4.6 million people have died from COVID-19. And I think the answer is, if we've got an effective treatment, we really should be using it. Uh, thank you. Can we go to the next question, Lisa? Uh, sorry, thanks, Dr. Moodley. I, I really appreciate your answers there. Um, I think uh, uh, s someone you can maybe just um, read up about, if I can just uh, uh, say this, about the antibody dependent enhancement is um, uh, Dr. Luc Montagnier. I'm not 100% sure how you spell his surname. It's a French guy, Luc Montagnier. Um, and you can you can read up about him. But thanks so much for your responses. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hugo. Thanks. thanks bye bye. Doc. So it is next up is Mzo. Yeah, Mzo Vuya. Mbalo. And then there are a couple of questions in the in the chat box. And then I just wanted to check in with you on time. There's five minutes left. I don't know how much time you've set aside in your diary. Let's go a little bit because we went into detail and I want to cover a little bit more content. Let's go till about five past five. I know people also have to go home, but let's see how what we can get through. So I think it's Mzo who's got the next question. Great. Hi, Doc. Hi there, please go. Uh, thanks you. Thank you for the opportunity, Doc. Uh, yesterday, I remember I watched um, a video on YouTube uh, from a doctor from US and he was commenting on the issue of uh, mandating vaccination and uh, he mentioned uh, something about uh, natural immunity to say those people who have natural immunity they are being discriminated and all sorts of things. Now I would like to understand doc from you what is the difference between someone who has natural immunity and someone who got the vaccine, which meaning that person got the immunity from the vaccine? Yeah. Um, and and also and also the the second question is, uh, I, I think what causes hesitancy? Uh, let let me say. In, in many people is to see that uh, doctors are not, uh, I'm not sure, but it, it seems like doctors are not at the forefront to advise us about, or they are not given opportunity to advise us about this COVID and vaccination. But all we see is that we see President Cyril Ramaphosa coming to tell us what is going to happen and all that. So that in a way is creating some sort of questions why doctors are not being uh, allowed and all the why right people are not allowed to consult their doctors to check if they should take these vaccines or, or not. And also, uh, what do you think about uh, if the South Africa decides to mandate the vaccines for people to get the vaccines what do you take what do you think that will cause to the people or you think that is a good advice for for us as south africans to go to a point where we are mandating these vaccines thank you Doc. wow so, so, so the reason i am here today is exactly one of the points you brought up so i talk about my family a lot right and again you know i i, I said 
to you from the beginning, right? The m and &M method. Again, it's not the singer, it's the, the science, right? I, I take you to the science and the other M is my motive. Why do I tell you the things that I want to help, right? So, so I noticed that my brother, he's got, he phones me, he phones his own doctor and he phones my cousin who's also a doctor. Unfortunately, not everyone is fortunate enough to be able to pick up the phone and phone a doctor and get that information. And that's why I want to bring the information to you, right? And if you are fortunate enough to have someone who's trained in this, then by all means speak to them, right? You asked about natural immunity versus uh, vaccine immunity. So it was the study in Kentucky that was done that looked at natural immunity versus vaccine immunity, uh, and it was the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, it was the mRNA vaccines actually, and they found that vaccine immunity was better than the uh, natural immunity and for that particular study. And what we find, so the answer is, the vaccines have a stronger protection and offer better immunity than if you get infected at this point in time, right? I always say that because new variants always throw things off. But so I'll tell you something interesting, right? So, so if you have had COVID-19 in the past, the question is always asked, should I get vaccinated? And remember I told you that, that my, uh, my brother got, got COVID-19 and I told him to go and get vaccinated. Right? I have two brothers, the other one also got COVID-19 and I also told him to go and get vaccinated. Right? Um, so the question about if you have natural immunity, should you get the vaccine? I want you to think about this. So have you watched Fast and the Furious? Do you know that movie? No, I, I think I have seen it, Doc. I don't like movies, so... Oh, no, man. Okay, all right. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'll do my best, right? But you're going to have to figure it, right? So these guys drive very fast, right? And we can think of their driving as very fast, as, as natural immunity. So you get infected and your body does develop immunity. Your body does develop immunity and you're driving very fast. And then these guys press something called NOS and they go like a turbo boost, right? And that's the vaccine for your immune system. So if you've been infected with COVID-19 and you take a vaccine, you get something called hybrid immunity. So you actually get better immunity than someone who just had natural immunity or someone who just had a vaccine. You've got what we call hybrid immunity. So it's recommended that if you have been infected, you get the vaccine because you actually have better immunity. Your last question was about mandatory vaccines. It is a topical issue in South Africa at the moment. And so the truth is, this is what I believe. I believe that it is the role of government to make a decision that is very clear about whether vaccines should be mandatory or not. And when we say mandatory, we don't mean lining people up and putting needles in their arms, but if you are in a particular high risk situation, like for example, you are a nurse working in an ICU or in an or age uh, home for the frail, whether you should be vaccinated or not to protect yourself and to protect the nurse. I think that's a decision for the government to make. And once they very clearly express that policy, it is then up to the various entities to make that call. And you will notice that several entities have made comments about that in South Africa. In the United States, which has a constitution, in France, um, not so much in the UK, although they are talking a little bit about it. In the United States and France, there are policies on mandatory vaccines and they have enacted that in their country. In this country, I'm not going to overstep my mark and say we should or we shouldn't do it. I, I think it is, a, it is a decision for the national government to make based on risk and based, based on what's the best interest uh, for the citizens of this, uh, for the residents of this country. So, so I'm not giving you an answer on that because I don't believe it's my place to make a call on that right now. Is that okay? Okay, thank you very much, Doug. Okay, it's a pleasure. Okay, guys, we had 502. So I know that there are questions in the chat, but I'm going to go through quickly what I call my fast, a few myths, and then I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you some slides and then we'll close off. But I will answer all the questions in the chat. I don't want anyone to feel that I, I, I don't want the chat. It's just that we're almost running out of time. So let's go quickly. 
Does the vaccine make me magnetic? No, it does not. Is there a microchip in the vaccine? No, there isn't. That was a strange rumor started. I think if you look at the vaccine itself, it's clear, right? So please look at it. It's about 0.3 mils, right? But it's okay to ask these questions, right? Uh, can they track me with the vaccine? No, they cannot track you with the vaccine. Here's a nice one. If I take the vaccine, will I get COVID-19 or will I test positive for COVID-19? No, you will not. The mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine do not contain the virus itself, right? There's no time to talk about the, the how they work, etc. I, I do that in some of my other talks, but they don't contain the virus itself. So they will, and they will not make, you will not test positive for COVID-19 if you take the vaccine. Some people ask that because they're traveling and they think, oh, I'm gonna get vaccinated. And am I, am I going to get, uh, am I going to test positive? You cannot be used. It, it's not to trace you. You can't be traced with the vaccine. And um, the vaccines, I've heard rumors, people talk about the vaccines killing people. There's no piles of bodies anywhere. The vaccine's not killing people. Uh, we test this thing very thoroughly. Um, and we were given almost 6 billion doses of the vaccine worldwide. Why were the vaccines developed very quickly? Interestingly, the vaccines were developed, and it's a long answer, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna do it justice, but the mRNA vaccines have actually been in development from 1990, not specifically for COVID-19, but they've been developing it. And when COVID-19 came about, uh, and the China, China released the, what we call the genotyping of COVID-19, they, they quickly, uh, maneuvered their, their their teams so that they would be able to um, they would be able to um, develop the COVID-19 vaccine. So the mRNA vaccines have been around uh, or have been in development since 1990, and the adenovirus vaccines, the viral vector vaccines, have been in development for a very long time. Okay, guys, I'm now going to give my closing statements, but I'll get to the questions at a later stage. The first thing I want to say is that the vaccines are extremely safe. Nothing is, a, is 100%, right? The hypertensive medication you take, the cholesterol medication you take, none of that is 100%. And the vaccines are not 100%. You will get side effects, and a very small percentage of people do get, side eff uh, do get serious side effects. I want to stress we can treat those side effects, right? To date, in South Africa, no one has, to, uh, we check every death after the vaccine. We have not found anyone who has died from the vaccine, right? We are continuing to investigate every case that comes in. The vaccines are incredibly safe, right? Now, I want you to think about this. Think about how safe the vaccines are versus the people that are dying from COVID-19. We have all lost someone to COVID-19. I have lost people to COVID-19. The va vaccine is a safe treatment against COVID-19, right? And the virus is a very serious cause of deaths from COVID-19. Something for you to think about. And then the last thing I'm going to show is this, right? I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you something, right? I'll also send you slides on what's inside the vaccine. So you're not gonna see my face. We're almost at the end, guys. And I'm going to show you, I'm gonna put it on slides. So this is a list of the ingredients of the vaccine. It does not contain the live virus. It does not contain metals. You'll be able to see this yourself. This is a picture from Hrutuskir Hospital. And here you can see on the 6th of September, they hospitalized patients, high care patients, and patients on ventilators. And they found that of their patients, the hospitalized ones, only three were vaccinated, the rest were unvaccinated. In the high care, everyone was unvaccinated. And the people on ventilators, these are the ones that are vaccinated. Uh, that are, uh, everyone on ventilators are unvaccinated. We then did some research in the Department of Health. We found that your risk of death was three times, 3.3 times higher in unvaccinated versus vaccinated healthcare workers, right? And then one more. They did a study in the US in 13 US health jurisdictions, and they found that if you are unvaccinated, if you're not fully vaccinated, 
you have an 11 times ch greater chance of hospitalization and a 10 times greater chance of death, right? The Pfizer vaccine offers, now I want to tell you this, if you take the vaccine, there's still a chance of getting infected, but it offers over 95% protection, protection against severe illness and death. If you take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it offers 91 to 96 protection against hospitalization and death. These are the facts. I've taken the vaccine, right? My whole family has taken the vaccine. We've given five, almost six billion doses of the vaccine, right? The vaccine protects. The people who are dying are actually the people who are unvaccinated. And I do need to stress that. Those are my final thoughts. And so I'm going to end by saying the following. You will be faced with a lot of information. I have done my best to give you all the factual information. Everything I said is supported by doctors across the world. Everything that I've said is supported by experts in this field across the world, medical experts, immunology experts, right? And you're welcome to check every reference that, I'm give, that I've given you, right? Always remember the M&M &M method, right? What is my method? I rely on scientific research. What is my motive? Why am I talking to you today? And this is the last part I'll leave you with. I'm talking to you today because I'm like you. I'm, I live in this country. I have friends, I have relatives, I have my mother-in-law and I like my mother-in-law. She's over 50 and I'm worried about her. You are worried about your family, you're worried about yourself. I want you to be safe. I want you to be protected. And I want us to go back to the life we used to lead, where we can go and hug each other and, and, and visit each other. Lastly, I've given you this information. You are intelligent people, and I ask you to think carefully and make good decisions about your health. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, hand over to Lisa to say, sign us off, Lisa, and thank you for your time. For those questions in the side, I'll address that at a later stage. Cool. Thanks, Dr. Mudley, and thanks to everybody that is on the call still. Um, I quickly flashed the, my screen, I'll just see, there you go. So if you want to follow up, um, you're more than welcome to send your questions through to me, and then we can get Dr. Mudley to answer them, and I'll, I'll mail you back. Also, a lot of the questions are covered in some of the resources that are on the um, government website. So there is a vaccine dashboard, so you can click on that link, um, I will copy it and put it into the, the chat as well. I uh, did it earlier in the meeting, but there are some lovely resources there as well as a real time dashboard of cases, of um, numbers being vaccinated, of sites close to you, et cetera, et cetera. So I do encourage you to go and have a look. But from our side, I'd like to just say thanks very much for joining us. I know it's like the suicide session at the end of the day, um, but you obviously do find the topic of interest and we're here to answer any further questions you may have. I'm not sure um, if we're going to end off with, there was a gentleman that was going to join us from NMU. Did he join eventually on the call? Doesn't sound like he did. So then it's- Good afternoon. Hi. I'm, my name is Fogora Mushaba. I'm the HOD for Student Life and Development in George. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Moodley and the team. It is highly appreciated, you know, your efforts of bringing the webinar to us, you know, to empower us and our student community and our staff members, you know, in all the myths and the challenges people have. It's highly appreciated, you know, we like these community partnerships and, you know, we thank you very much and we wish you God can give you strength to go forward and help our communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that is a good note to end off on and say, hoo-hoo, it's almost Friday. Enjoy tomorrow. Enjoy the weekend. Be safe. And let's get back to the life we love. Cheers, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank thanks you so much. Bye. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.